So now we're going to do some examples of dimensional analysis. We shall start with the flow through an orifice plate. The flow has speed big V in a pipe of diameter big D. It goes through an orifice of diameter little d and we want to measure the pressure drop from one side of the orifice to the other. And the fluid has density rho and viscosity mu. So we start by writing down the dependent variable, which is delta P, that's what you want to measure. And then we write down the independent variables. So there's the property of the fluid, rho, and its viscosity, mu, the speed of the fluid, V, the size of the pipe, and the size of the orifice. Both of those are diameters. Step two is to count up the number of variables and the number of dimensions. The number of variables is six, the number of dimensions is three, because I have meters, seconds, and kilograms, and that means that I'm expecting three dimensionless numbers. One of those dimensionless numbers has to contain the dependent variable, delta P. So let's look at its units. P is a pressure, that is a newton per meter squared. Newton is a mass times acceleration, so that's a kilogram meter per second squared divided by meters squared. So overall, pressure has units kilogram meter to the minus one seconds to the minus two. Now we look at the independent variables. Two of them contain units of kilograms, and we could use either to non-dimensionalize delta P. However, when I think back to the chapter on pipe flow, I remember that a non-dimensionalized delta P with respect to the inertial forces, which is the dynamic pressure, a half rho V squared. I didn't non-dimensionalize them relative to the viscous forces, although I could have done. The density has units kilograms per meter cubed. Therefore, delta P upon rho has units of meters squared seconds to the minus two. And obviously the way to get rid of meters squared seconds to the minus two is to divide by velocity squared, and that exactly gets rid of all the units. And then I put in a half in order to give it the physical meaning of the dynamic pressure. So the first dimensionless number is the loss coefficient k defined as delta p upon a half rho v squared. I continue that process and I find two independent dimensionless numbers and the obvious ones to use are the Reynolds number which is rho v d upon mu and d upon d, the ratio of the orifice diameter to the diameter of the pipe. Now I carry out the experiment in which I measure the loss coefficient k as a function of the Reynolds number and d upon d, and then I plot the results. And that's what has been done here, and this result is taken from Miller's book. And here's another example. We want to evaluate the lift and drag coefficients of a Boeing 747 by testing a geometrically similar model in a wind tunnel, so it has the same shape but a very different size. What conditions are required in the wind tunnel for complete similarity? Now remember that an aeroplane travels near the speed of sound, Mach 1, so the density of the fluid cannot be taken to be uniform and constant. So step one, write down the dependent variables. These are the drag, and the lift. For the independent variables, we have the properties of the air, that is the density far away from the aeroplane, the viscosity, d is a characteristic length scale of the aeroplane, v is the speed of the air around the aeroplane, and alpha is the angle of attack of the aeroplane. And because the aeroplane is flying close to the speed of sound, we also need to include a, which is the speed of sound, which is a dimensional measure of the compressibility of the fluid. Now we count up the dimensions and the number of variables. There are eight variables. Once again, there are three dimensions. They are kilograms, meters, and seconds. And that means that we're expecting five dimensionless numbers. And now we create these. And of course, it's best to use standard numbers that we've seen before. These are things like the drag coefficient CD, which is the drag divided by a half rho v squared times an area, which in this case is just the characteristic distance squared. The lift coefficient, which is the lift over a half rho v squared d, the same denominator as before. The Reynolds number, as we expect for a fluid problem with viscosity, 
alpha the angle of attack, now that's already non-dimensional, so we can just leave it as it is. And finally, the Mach number, which is defined as the speed of the flow around the aircraft, divided by the speed of sound in that fluid. Now remember why we're doing this. We're trying to test our model in a wind tunnel and to match all the important dimensionless numbers. Obviously it's easy to match the angle of attack. We just change the angle of attack in the wind tunnel. But can we match the Reynolds number and the Mach number simultaneously? Because for complete similarity between the model and the full scale, we need the Reynolds number to be the same and the Mach number to be the same. So matching the Mach numbers gives us this expression, Vm over Am equals Vf over Af, where subscript M is the model, subscript F is the full scale. Matching the Reynolds numbers gives us this expression. Rearranging these gives these two expressions underneath. So we see that the ratio of the speeds of the model to the full scale is dictated by the ratio of the speeds of sound. And because A is equal to the square root of gamma RT, this is dictated by the temperatures and by gamma R. In other words, by the ratio of the specific heat capacities and by the gas constant. But to match the Reynolds number, we find that the same velocity ratio must satisfy this expression. Now the second half of this, df over m, is fixed for a given model size. It's the scale of the model. So we see that in order to match the Reynolds number and the Mach number, we need to change the density, the viscosity, or the temperatures of the fluid in the wind tunnel. And in practice, this is achieved by pressurizing the wind tunnel. Having said that, we know that for flows in which inertial forces dominate, the Reynolds number has little influence once it is big, by which I mean above around 10 to the 6. Therefore, it would be wisest to match the Mach number and let the Reynolds number float, making sure that it is large. And that will be a relatively good compromise for this problem. The final example is to estimate the drag force on a ship. Now let's think first of all about where this drag force comes from. First of all, there's the natural fluid mechanical drag that comes from the wake of the ship, i.e. as the ship moves through the water, it drags a bit of water along with it and that recirculation zone behind the ship has a slightly lower pressure than the pressure at the front of the ship, and that gives us form drag. And there's also skin friction drag. I will lump these together and just call those fluid mechanical drag. But on a ship, there's also another very important type of drag that arises because as it travels along, there's a system of waves, surface waves, that is, behind it, which radiate energy away. So if the ship is traveling in the direction of the arrow, we see a set of waves behind it that look something like this. And as the ship travels forwards and the waves move away, they radiate energy away. And the ship experiences this as drag. Now let's think about surface waves between water and air. What's the restoring force for this wave? Well, it's gravity. So we need to make sure that we include gravity in this problem. So step one, write down the dependent and independent variables. Well, in this case, I'm only interested in the drag. And the independent variables are the speed of the boat, which I'm going to call u, the size of the boat, which I shall measure by its length and give the symbol d, the viscosity of the water, the density of the water, and g, the gravitational acceleration. So we count up the number of dimensions and the number of variables. There are six variables, three dimensions, and therefore we're expecting three dimensionless numbers. So now we create these dimensionless numbers. Bearing in mind we want to keep them conventional where possible. Well obviously we have a drag coefficient, we have a Reynolds number, and now we need to include an independent parameter involving g, and the sensible choice here is the Froude number defined as u divided by the square root of g d. And you can think of this in a number of different ways. It's a bit like a Mach number, in that it measures the speed of the boat relative to the speed of surface water waves. Or, if you prefer, you can square top and bottom and multiply them by rho. And, broadly speaking, we have a ratio of dynamic pressure to hydrostatic pressure, where that assumes that d, the size of the boat, is related to the height of the waves that it generates. Now, in order to get complete similarity, we would have to match Reynolds number and Froude number.
and that gives us a simple relationship between the ratios of the kinematic viscosities, mu upon rho, in the model fluid and in the real fluid. And we quickly see that we cannot match both Reynolds number and Froude number without using some very esoteric fluids. So what do we do? Well, we know that the drag coefficient CD is some function, as yet unknown, of the Reynolds number and the Froude number. Can we use some physical reasoning here? The first question is, are the Reynolds number effects likely to be independent of the Froude number effects, and vice versa? Because if they are, then we can write this as CD, the drag coefficient, is equal to CD due to the wave drag, which is a function of the Froude number, plus CD of the fluid mechanical drag, which is a function of the Reynolds number. And just as a reminder, by fluid mechanical drag, I mean form drag and skin friction. We know in the ocean that a wave period is a few seconds, but that if we were to wait for all the waves to become calm due to viscosity, that would take several days, from which we surmise that viscosity has only a weak effect on wave motion on the scale of the ocean. Furthermore, gravity can have little effect on the normal fluid mechanical wake associated with the body. Therefore, it does seem sensible to treat the wave terms and the fluid mechanical terms as independent and additive. So having decided to do that, we perform two separate experiments. First, we test the model around the correct Froude number and measure the drag in total. And here's a diagram of that. Now for the next experiment, we take the underwater shape, that is the bit of the boat that is actually in contact with the water, and we create its mirror image and stick it together. And then, in experiment two, we measure the fluid mechanical drag on this body when it's fully submerged. And this means that we can eliminate the wave drag from this experiment. And then we subtract the fluid mechanical drag from the total drag in order to get the wave drag.